You know, we have had a lot of different guests over the course of 500 episodes or so of the exam room, but not once have we had a legit rock star, and certainly nobody has ever had a proper head of hair quite like our guest today. Tanya Callahan. thanks for being here. I feel like I should be a boomerang. Right you, now. Yeah, you should. Look, <laughs> boomerang, look at you, you Instagram hippie, you. It's really good to see you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Legit rock star. Yeah, I'll put those two words out. together. Like Legit? What makes a rock star legit? Your hair. Okay. A hundred percent. Taken. I mean, well, your day job, you play bass for some of the biggest bands out there. We're going to get into a lot of health stuff, I promise you. But we, we just, this is your first time on the show. People need to know who Tanya is. I think a lot of people are looking at me walking around wondering why I'm at a medical conference. You scare the people. <laughs> but the people need to be scared. But you, nobody... Uh, that's the cool thing, though, right? It's like you kind of are shattering the stigma that, you know, it's like you have to be this way or that way to be a proper vegan. And clearly, mm. you march to the beat of your own drum, girl. Yes, definitely. I like my drum. Yeah, I bet <laughs> you do. I thought you were a bassist. Do you play the drum, too? Badly, badly. I think badly? every every musician is like a failed drummer. So, right. You know, non-drummers. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's yeah. let's talk about this. So, <laughs> legitimately, though, we don't have to go down the roster of bands that you've played with. It's impressive. But... You do travel the world playing music, and you have been eating a plant-based diet for how long now? My whole life, yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah, my whole life. I mean, we didn't have the words for, for any of these like diets in Ireland. I was just an accidental vegan. So, yeah. It's, how did this happen? Oh, oops. I just fell, and then I was like, oh, my God, I'm a vegan. Um, no, I was four when I realized what meat was, so I was uh. a, a tiny tot in small town Ireland, and I made the association with animals very, very young. And I also didn't like the taste of dairy. It was sour. My mom kind of has the same thing. So there was there was really no dairy in my diet anyway by default. And then as soon as I re- figured out that my friend, the cow, who I thought was my pet, Daisy, was on the table, or my brother told me that. Obviously, it wasn't actually Daisy, but he was, you know, uh. he was messing with me. And I just started crying. And I remember it vividly. And I was like, hold on a minute. As most kids do, they make that connection. And then we kind of, you know, obviously suppress it and we normalize eating animals. But I made that very young and I stayed completely hell bent on it. And I've been screaming about animal rights since I was a very annoying little girl and still am. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get people to, to listen though? Like, especially, <clears throat> you know, at a conference like this where clearly you are the only one walking around with that funky head of hair, right? <laughs> But like you can still have these really cool conversations, this nice dialogue. Like, how do you begin to have that with people who haven't had that same type of experience, that same epiphany that you have had? Yeah, in my case, obviously, I've been doing this my whole life. So it's very easy for me to be I don't even tend to use the word vegan. Obviously, I am a mm. proud ethical vegan on paper. But I just think that like living by example, doing what I do as well in my world and staying healthy on the road and, you know, the stereotypes that go go with musicians and, and rock and roll is quite different these days. And it's fun for me to travel and talk and go to, especially I love this. I'm a big dork, really. I'm not rock and roll no, at all. Out, I'd girl. much prefer to be in a medical <laughs> conference. I'm just like, oh, this is awesome. I get to learn. <laughs> we should get you a lab coat with some flames on it. Ha- oh my God, like I'm so happy you got a lab coat. Did you? Yeah, I was like, I hope I don't have to give it back. You got a keepsake? Yeah, I think so. A plus. Or don't tell anyone, sorry. Oh, I'm oh. keeping it. Cut. <laughs> I felt very, very special to have one the other day. Oh, but, did uh, you do the Dr. White House photo? Is that what well, happened? Well, we started going there and then torrential rain uh, appeared. So we bailed and went to plant a queen. <laughs> well, that, you know, that works too. Should but yeah, get... but it's ama- it's been amazing because I, I get to have really interesting conversations because people are kind of semi-confused why I'm here. But, uh, but I've actually worked in this long before I was a musician. So from 8 to 18, I worked in a rescue shelter and I was a vet's assistant and I worked very, very hands-on with animal rights. So I was doing undercover investigations and rescue and rehab for, for 10 straight years. That was my path. And then I picked up a base at 17 and did a 180. The rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did not know that you went undercover. So you've seen some things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah brutal. I worked in a shelter for 10 straight years and it was, it was full on. It was really hard. Yeah. Like everything, court cases, like, you know, legal battles, undercover rescues. It was, yeah, talk it was to, intense. Talk to me about the, the undercover rescues. So you'd have to collect, you know, information. Like now there's ag gag laws over here. This is way back in the day in Ireland. But we would get calls from anonymous people all over Ireland saying, you know, they had seen 
It could be dogs, it could be horses, it could be downed farm animals that were neglected or left. We've seen a lot of that where um, people had just run out of money to couldn't keep the animals, so they just abandoned them a lot mm. of the time, which is there's so many parts of that are sad and devastating because also farmers are struggling in the equation, right? But um, And it could be anything like animal hoarding. We had uh, just horrible people who abuse animals, and you, you got anonymous calls all the time saying mm. you know at this address such and such is happening and i was really young working at that shelter i started at eight volunteering so by the age of about 12 i was on these like call out teams and then we were rehabbing animals from awful awful situations so it was full on so i saw a little bit too much too young but it really you know obviously there's no going back on the fight you're going to fight your whole life when you see this but sure. you also see a lot of beautiful stuff as well yeah you know we had a lot of amazing cases and we did a lot of collaborations with shelters in different countries and everything and it was i got to travel really young to some interesting stuff and yeah animals taught me a lot like they really did and it was hard work as well like there's a reason i'm a really hard worker in a hustle. yeah like working yeah, yeah. working in those shelters is no joke and it's all volunteer based so. i want to go back to this this rescue thing i want to stay on this for a second tanya because it's hard for a lot of adults to see some of these images i mean they are quite graphic you spend any time on social media thumbing through x formerly twitter whatever the case may be you see this it's like holy smokes but like you were actually witnessing witnessing this at a young age how did you deal with it you said like you saw a little bit too much at, at, at a young age but like how in the world did you cope yeah it's uh, it was definitely intense but the the way that the shelter was ran was all volunteer so we didn't have um any of the resources and we didn't have we didn't have a choice. It was like if we got a call out, whoever was volunteer that day and the couple that ran the shelter, we just would go because you, you're in fight or flight right, mm -hmm. for the animals. So you have to just go and do whatever is necessary in that moment. So in hindsight, a lot of while it was happening, although you are shocked and sad, you're just you just go into tunnel vision and you're like, OK, we got to get the animal out. And then you, we were so busy. I spent so much of my time there. It was unbelievable. And then you get the animal and then you're rehabbing the animals. So you're in this process through the animal's life and hopefully, you know, it's full rehab. So you definitely bury a lot of it. And it's something I started to realize in my mid teens. I was like, God, I'm really like generally a happy go lucky person. Mm. But I was feeling a lot of weight and heaviness around it emotionally. And I didn't quite understand it because I'm also from like small town Ireland where people don't talk about emotions or mental health. Like <laughs> under the guise of the Catholic Church your entire life. <laughs> like don't say anything. But um, what I was also doing was I've, since I was really young, I was writing activist letters to like the Minister for Agriculture and the Pope and Santa, you name it, I wrote them a letter. <laughs> so I was like finding ways to kind of purge my thoughts and I have all these crazy poetry books I found when I was an adult, it's funny. So I don't think I really dealt with it, I was just in action all the time for animals when I was young, I was just completely in action. But then when I started to veer off into a music career, I felt it was a really a great and stronger path for me because I'd done all the boots on the ground work for so many years, yeah. full on activism, you know, barred from fur shops, frontline, like at all the rallies, like I was hot headed. Yeah. I got that out of my system in a way. I learned so much. It taught me seriously hard work. Um, there was no time off or days off. And then you, you, you have all this foundational work in that. And then you go, OK, well, now how can I be of service to animals and the planet? And I have this, mm. this platform now. Mm. So it kind of it shifted. But I get to be an activist in a way that's probably a bit better for my own mental health. Really. Yeah. So when you're talking to somebody like, I mean, how how do you approach them? Like initially, I think you, you just kind of said like you, you went at them like a little bit harder. Right. <laughs> But people tend to shut down when you come yeah. hard, yeah. right? So how, how have you found that is the best way to get somebody to stop and to pay attention mm -hmm. and to not be so adversarial when you're talking about these things? Yeah, well, I was young and fiery then, you know? I'm glad I got it out I my system. I think you're still fiery, maybe just in a different way. <laughs> Older and less fiery. No, I'm definitely fiery. Okay. But, uh, Come on, girl. Yeah. but it's true, you know, and I, I don't regret any of that. And I understand because vegans are always debating on, like, what's the right approach. I mean, there's room for everyone at the table if it's sure. helping. But, it, yeah, it doesn't work for a lot of people when you're screaming, whatever, meat is murder, or you're, you know, throwing blood outside a fur shop. But, you know, there's time and a place for different types of activism. But because I have that, background i can see now in hindsight okay i probably scared more people off mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> but i also food is definitely 
the greatest, like it's humanity's greatest uniter and food. I'm a massive foodie. Not, I don't really like that word. Of course, everybody loves food, but for lack of a better term, love, love, love the travel, the exploring food that comes with it. And what I found is just sharing this like abundance of food as I travel all over the world and yeah. showing people how I eat backstage, how I eat on the road, how we do the backstage catering, how easy it is to find vegan options everywhere. And I tend to stay, aw- stay away from... Like, I'm not constantly seeking out vegan. Like, I'll often go to a steakhouse and show, you know, this is where I got the best meal ever because they have fresh produce. And I believe going to non-vegan places is really good because you're, by putting in the request for it, they're going to start to go, oh, there's a demand for it. Yeah. So things like that. And just, I guess, leading by example, being healthy, showing that, like, I'm alive my whole life somehow without protein i've no mm-hmm. idea mm, yeah, oh yeah it's like yeah without pro you've How never had I any here? protein yeah my god you're an enigma woman <laughs> so you know it's just like yeah if i'm i'm good like i've been yeah. doing this my whole life so i guess a lot of it is people just going all right you look seem to be healthy and happy and right on. it seems to be doable so i guess just food is, is a massive uniter for people to have great conversations i agree we're going to come back to food but mm-hmm. i, I want to go back to the rescue like can you walk us through what a rescue typically was like what was your role were you sneaking onto a farm somewhere were you sneaking into somebody's backyard what was the rescue operation actually like So there was different ones. Like we had a few hoarder situations where you get a call from like a neighboring person that's like, I think they're keeping a lot of animals in the house, but you have to get evidence. So you would call sometimes. And if there was no answer, there would be some, you know, you'd sneak around the back and have to try and get photos. Back then it was really hard because, you know, we didn't have the digital cameras we have in our pockets now. You try, you always try first to communicate in any situation, right? Because you don't know what's going on with the person. You can't immediately point the finger. Someone could be mentally ill. There could be anything going on. There could be extreme poverty. So it would just depend on the case. And then we did, like I remember one year ago when we found out that there was no body in the house. They had just abandoned a load of animals. So we had to break in, but you have to get the police involved. And then depending on the severity of the cruelty, um, some would have to just be put down because it was too bad. Mm. And you're like, let's just put them out of their misery because it's not, it's, there's no going back from like extreme, extreme um, neglect. And then you'd have beautiful cases where I would take a lot of animals on that quite often, not always, but quite often animals have been abused by male figures. So they would literally not trust the guys at the shelter. So I spent a lot of my time rehabbing animals that were completely afraid of any male character. Um, So I had horses and chickens and cats and all sorts that you just spend every waking hour like bottle feeding them back and medication and warmth and all that. And a lot of them bounced back. We lost a lot. With the bigger animals, you had to get like the SPCAs involved, the police involved, because it's very hard to move like a cow or a horse. We had horses we found in ditches that were dumped Mm. into ditches Mm. like and that was really really tough because and I got a lot of injuries because we would have to get ropes and like put it under the horse and it was a lot of young volunteers and maybe one or two guys and we're literally trying to physically take animals out got a lot of the strange thing that happens in Ireland where people dump animals in bags into the river which is a way to get rid of kittens and puppies that went on for a long time. I hope it doesn't still, but that was strange. But some people would see it happen and call immediately because we were the only shelter in a small town. Yeah. And someone had just seen someone do it instead of just abandoning them at the shelter. So we would go as quick as we could and hope that we could find the bag downstream. And sometimes you'd have, you know, six or seven drowned kittens and one would would live. So we, we just did our best. But, you know, as well as that, the older and wiser you get was like, let's try to get education programs in place because you just, again, you can't, you can fight all day long with the opposite side, but we started to get involved then in a lot of traps bay release. Mm. So you go into the communities that tend to be doing this most and be like, Hey, here are vouchers. You can get your pets spayed. Here's a free voucher. Just let's stop this cycle. Yeah. So there was all sorts of different iterations of it and it was pretty intense and I'd yeah, all sorts of animals over the years. Dag on. Yeah, it and crazy. at such a young age you're doing that, man. Yeah, it was intense. That's it. Like I would have developed a serious emotional callus like mm-hmm. just by default just to go into self preservation mode at that point. That's a hard thing to see, Tanya. Toughens you up. Yeah. Legit. All right. Well, let's talk about something a little more happy and that (laughs) universal, you don't like the word foodie, but food brings them together, man. You know, um, 
You said that you like to go to non-vegan restaurants, and that's kind of how you educate things. One of the things that I was shocked when I started to eat a plant-based diet was, and I'm not a huge fan of going to a steakhouse, but if that's where my family, extended family, wants to go, I have always found it particularly easy to eat a plant-based meal at a steakhouse, which there is a lot of irony there. Yeah. A lot of irony. I know, but isn't it great? It's I mean, the reason I use steakhouses as an example, because it's a real typical choice of like if I'm at a, a music conference, like the music version of this, all the guitar companies, they always pick a steakhouse for the for the group dinners on tour. A lot of people, not so much now because people are a bit more woke up to it. But so and they I get these emails or messages or calls going, I know you're vegan, but sorry, we booked the steakhouse. I'm like, it's fine. And because you know that, especially if it's like a high end, whatever that means, like a fancy steakhouse, they're going to have really good seasonal produce. Yeah. And it's interesting all over the world in these like in fish restaurants and steakhouses, if you politely ask and you're not a pain in the ass and you talk to the chef, hey, you know, I'm vegetarian, vegan, or you want to say you have an intolerance or whatever, you don't want to get into a fight about food. Would you mind making something with the vegetables? And quite often the chefs, actually most of the time, the chef's excited to make something different because they're making the same thing over and over again for the usual clientele. And I've literally had the best meals of my life in steakhouses, and, and that sounds shocking, but and in like a fish restaurant in Cape Town because the chef was so excited. He's like, oh my God, I get to... Like he's a French trained chef and he's making the same dish all day long. And right. he made this incredible like Juliana yeah. vegetable. So it's fun. And it also gets conversations going, you know. So I think the food is just such a great bridgeway for so many things. And and the your fellow band members, you know, do they kind of look at what, you know, what's time to eat tonight? <laughs> maybe, 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 let's go ahead and leave this over here. I want what she's having. Yeah, you get yeah. a lot of that? Yeah, big time. And I kind of like most bands that I join, they know I'm like, you're getting a bass player, but you're also getting a very outspoken activist in the band. So, you know, I come with all this yeah. activist baggage. <laughs> you accept it as it is, right? But, uh, and they know I love food. So I will ask like to have a majority say on backstage catering because it's not just about veganism, right? It's about feeling healthy on the road and staying sure. healthy. So, and that's really hard when you're touring because you're just, it's just, it looks glamorous from the outside, but it's a really intense lifestyle with not enough sleep and a lot of movement. So, when I bring in like a lot of plant-based catering and then the guys tend to feel better oh. and they're like, oh, I'm lighter. Oh, I feel more satiated or, you know, my inflammation's gone down. And the next thing I have them all doing yoga and we're eating vegetables and it's so not rock and roll. The master like, Sorry planner. to, you know, spoil the whole idea people have Planet. but they do and but and also a lot of musicians these days like the the stereotypical image people have of rock and roll is really a handful of bands maybe do that but most people it's such a hard industry that you have to keep on top of your health mm. so and it's in order like you're on the you're on the road for months on end right you have to stay healthy so if they feel good and there's you often get a bunch of guys that don't really particularly care what they're eating once they're just eating. As long as it tastes so, good, basically. Yeah, and I get really good stuff brought in and their minds are blown and they're like, oh, okay, this is great. Let's do this. So what's on Tanya's food rider? What are the must-haves? <laughs> it's quite boring. The backstage rider is always the same because, well, you try not to eat. It's hard. I'm I naturally intermittent fast. It's not like a plan. I, I just I'm not hungry in the morning, which is great because once I start eating, I I'm like a horse. It just never <laughs> stops. I just burn calories all day. But I try not to eat too much after stage because you get a false hunger from adrenaline when you come off stage. So before I tend to just have like steamed broccoli, rice or a grain of some type because it's plain also because you're touring globally. So you want consistency. So mm -hmm. it's all well and good if I'm somewhere in the US on the East or West Coast and I can get, you know, seitan skewers and tofu this and tempeh that. You can't, in order for me not to have to change my rider everywhere I go, I just keep it kind of basic. It's like a whole grain of some type, um, always nuts and seeds around, some broccoli, some beetroot or something like that. I tried to get like the whole rainbow in and I, I have that as a baseline rider so that no matter where you go globally, they generally have that. And then, you know, I'll check in advance if there's a great vegan restaurant nearby or a vegan catering company. And every now and then we get like a whopper caterer that comes in and it just blows everyone's mind. Right on. Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We just had that in Brazil. We had like a speciality vegan catering company come in for the Brazil shows. Get and out. It was unreal, the food. Oh, my God. The band were like, what? Did you have the same caterer throughout the country? <laughs> 
No, no, it depends where you are. If you're somewhere like the UK, you'll have a caterer because it's a smaller country, so yeah. you can you can hop. But you know, if you're in, you, you tend to. It depends on the size of the tour. You won't always bring catering with you, but right. or in house will supply it. But if you're in somewhere like South America, it's too big. You can't carry a crew like that, so you just get local. Now, are you the one that's actually working with the caterer, or do you put that on your manager or the tour promoter? Whose job is it actually to sit down and say, "Hey, this is what we're getting." <laughs> you submit your rider to your tour manager, and your tour manager puts it forward. But because I'm such an involved person with food, I tend to be like, "Hey, by the way, here's a list of." <laughs> I was because I was just thinking because I was like, you know what? Like, not a lot of people eat an exclusively plant based diet. You don't want to put that on somebody who's yeah. not all that yeah. familiar. But I mean, the psychology around food is so interesting. Like when I look at most of what's there, other than those, I won't curse, I'll try not to curse even though yeah, I'm Irish. Do what you gotta do. The typical trays that like any event has backstage, like these meat trays, these cheese trays. And the, the approach I took with a lot of that is more guys, it's such a waste, nobody's eating this. Mm. These meat trays are just rotting and being thrown in the bin. The food waste alone, irregardless of you care about animals or you're plant-based or whatever. Um, so it's like starting with things like that. It's like, let's take, cause they're just a default on a musician's rider. For some reason, someone along the way made that decision. There's always a meat tray and a cheese tray and a fruit tray and nobody eats, nobody eats it. It's so like people will pick from it. So I was like, look, waste wise, cause food waste is something I'm very passionate about as well. Stop. If you really want it, you'll know in a few days, a few shows in, God, I really meet them, you know, miss the meat tray. Yeah. So people are like, yeah, it's very wasteful, isn't it? Because it's also about like our use of plastic on the road. It's such a wasteful industry. Mm. So it's like coming at it from, from different approaches. But there's also like a lot of the snacks and fruit and there's, there is like vegan things, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Are you taking your own utensils with you, reusable, or you go with the biodegradables, or what do you do there? And it depends on the tour. So if we're packing up on the start of a tour, like, and we're sending, so say, for instance, we're, we're going out from wherever, California, and the crew are going to pack our wardrobe, mm -hmm. um, our roller cases, and our crew, I will pack some stuff in that. Like, so, you know, my yoga mat goes in, and some of the stuff I like to have in my dressing room, and I will, I'll put in, like, reusable or glass truck, because I hate the plastic. I have, like, no plastic in my backstage room, mm. because I hate the look of it as well. Um, and just trying to make those little steps, yeah. Yeah. And then, and I'm really, really blessed to have a lot of friends who own restaurants all around the world. So yeah. every city I roll into, they're like, we're sending food to the venue. I'm spoiled like that, because I make nice. friends with a lot of food people <laughs> nice well, it's it's helpful isn't it and then they send too much so i go around giving it out and the band are like this is vegan I'm like yep yeah man. yeah like i get i'm really lucky like that people because they know if they follow me like they know how much i love food so they yeah. send me stuff have a, um have you ever like fully had somebody make that conversion over to a plant-based diet just because they've like seen what you've eaten they've sampled it like dang on that's pretty it, what you good. mean in the bands in the bands yeah. yeah a lot actually and not necessarily like fully labeled vegan i also don't push that it's like look you spend time enough time around me and you know traveling together a lot of already like veering that way musicians that are healthy and health conscious will end up being majority plant-based mm. and i think that's great i'm not there to like drill home the last five percent yeah so a lot a lot of them do and after tours and stuff over the years they'll stay in touch but a lot of crew which is where i target so a lot of the music industry i say target like it's like a mission <laughs> i'm coming for but you I'm coming for you because typically a lot of industry crews i'm talking about like your backline guys lighting your roadies your riggers these guys are road dogs they've been on the road for 30 40 years and they're very it's a very stereotypical road diet they're eating fast food because you can get it everywhere we go they're drinking coca-cola or mountain dew they're all hypertension diabetes you know overweight. oh they got them all do they and they don't don't know anything about food because they live on the road. They're real crew dudes. Right. So I like I'm like, give me that. Like, let's go. <laughs> let's go. And I've had some really amazing stories actually with crew over the years. A couple of the crew curing diabetes just by eating with me on sure. the road. Yeah, yeah. And like massive weight loss. And then, you know, it's fun because, you know, you move I, I'm a freelancer, so obviously I've been in multiple different bands. So that's like my tour family for a year or two and then I'm on to the next tour family. But I'll stay in touch with some of the guys over the years that are like i stuck to it and i feel great and i lost all this weight and oh, they just man. but they didn't know and it can be something as simple as switching out um like a fizzy drink as we call them in ireland your sodas over here yeah, like any yeah, type yeah. of uh, a fizzy drink for water or for a sparkling water which is mind-blowing to a lot of people because 
a lot of guys like that had no idea that there are like calories in these drinks because it's liquid they don't have the association of like this is they never put that together no a lot of people don't because they're drinking it and you're like hey turn around whatever product it is and you're like there's 46 59 80 something grams of sugar yeah um just drink sparkling water instead so that simple switch would be would be like a huge shift and then instead of even if it's not perfect like if you're still going for fast food get the beyond burger and get it try to get a healthier side and just make these little incremental changes And then they feel better because it's hard to live on the road. Like with the bands, it's hard enough when you're tour busing. But we have a little bit more luxury in the sense that, you know, we're obviously usually going to a hotel after even if it's a long bus drive. But the crew live on buses like they live on buses and it's a tough life. And they're rigging and they're there hours before us and hours after us. And they're the hardest working people in the industry by a mile. And they're the unhealthiest people in the industry as well. Not all of them. Obviously, you've got, you know, the go-getters but it's uh, it's really interesting i love that about touring because if you can have a positive impact like that on your tour family in some way and it's not pushy you know they no, just see no, i'm no, doing no, no, yoga no, no. before shows and handing broccoli out and you know i would imagine like <laughs> speaking of like yoga it would be to um, their advantage to be you know limber and fit because that that is a that's a hard job man you are lifting heavy stuff day in day out yeah. multiple times a day yeah yeah big yeah time. Big yeah time. They need to look at every all of us do. I mean, in whatever you do, but it is it's a it's a tough industry. People don't see the what goes into putting a show mm. together. And like long after the band and everyone has left the venue as well, these guys are still there tearing it down. Oh yeah, yeah. roadies, so it's man. Like, yeah, roadies are shout out to all the roadies, my favorite people. They are hardworking <laughs> individuals. Like, you know what I would love to do? I would love to do a show with you and a roadie or two who you've actually impacted and just get that full story as yeah, well. We just do a whole documentary on it. Duh, oh God, like let I me love doing like documentaries. just be behind the scenes. I don't care. Yeah, just yeah. let me be involved in that. That would be fascinating yeah, yeah like legit fascinating yeah. um what are some of the bands that the exam roomies who are watching or listening right now uh, might be familiar with who you've had the the privilege of playing for well i mean i'll go back i'll start at the beginning back in ireland back in the day um first band, well they wouldn't really be known here so i did like some of the girls from the cores if anyone knows the, the cores, cores so yeah. i'm going right back to when like i started i did like pop bands no one would ever know over here brian mcfadden westlife had uh sharon core and then i did like the house band for the late late show and uh the voice and all this these different shows like that before i made the leap of faith to come over to the u.s you're making a face so you're like the late what? late sh- not the one here so oh, we have our own i was like hmm. yeah so okay. my foundations of a lot of what i did was in house bands and tv shows right and then on. when you play in the house band you get gigs off the back of that and that's where yep. this all started to happen and then when I was in my early 20s, for anyone that knows Tool, if you're oh, yeah, metal man. prog, I, mean, man, I love that whole genre. Maynard um, brought me over to record. Maynard Keenan brought me to Arizona. And that's what kicked off the American idea of being over here because Maynard took a risk on me as a young player and I wrote and recorded with him for his other project, Pussifer. So people usually know Tool. He has Tool, A Perfect Circle and Pussifer, which is um, a lot of guests. It's like a revolving door. Yeah. And I met them in Glasgow and I was doing a show and Tool were doing a show and we just, you know, we clicked and we were talking music and he invited me to play. I was like, uh, yeah, like I will definitely come over and play for you. That's dope. <laughs> so that triggered a a thing in my head he was definitely a catalyst for like well if i can go to the u.s and play with someone that i admire that much musically but is is that big of a deal in the music industry what else could happen if i mm-hmm. you know jumped across the pond and see what happens so then after that i went back and forth to ireland a lot and i was just doing like all sorts of like wedding bands corporate bands still working in animal rights a lot and then i moved to la and i was just you just have to get in the scene. It's really weird because I came back to zero. I was playing with everyone you could possibly play with in Ireland and across Europe. But it's such a small scene that at a certain point you've rotated around Mm -hmm. and you can't, you're not really going to get any further. So when I came to the US and I was kind of back down at the bottom. So I just, I came on my own base on my back and I started playing jam nights. So they're like open jam nights. So, you know, professional musicians that are off tour kind of rotating around these scenes in LA. And eventually people start to see you play. And the first, I had a pop gig for a while with a kid called Jordan Fisher that was more in R- R&B and toured with him for a while. And then and then Dee Snyder's band saw me, Dee from Twisted Sister. And Dee hired me to do what was supposed to only be like 
a one or two show thing and then we toured together for like two years and wow. did an album and Dee's amazing so Dee was one of my first like American rock and roll things and then after Dee I was with Stephen Adler Guns N' Roses and then immediately after that White Snake and then Bruce Dickinson Iron Maiden so uh, I just went through the 80s like a wildfire that's like shit man <laughs> I don't know how it happened I don't know how I just like swept the 80s for some reason that's amazing <laughs> man that just speaks to the old part of me that was I mean, that, that hits, classic hits, rock hits, dj hits. man that's yeah, amazing yeah. and i'm really like it's it's lovely because i you know a member of white snake and will be until ever he decides to to cut it but he's they're brilliant to work with and then bruce i'm just like i can't believe it. it's so fun yeah, for real yeah man. and good people everyone is just good people girl that's a that's a charmed kind of professional yeah. life you got there they that's pretty amazing me and my vegetables which is nice <laughs> well it still has that rubbed off on on somebody like a d like is he open yeah, to the yeah, whole idea d of going is, to a plant-based restaurant d's whole that? family are vegan and d is like he's always joking because he's like someone's got to eat meat in this family <laughs> <laughs> But he eats very little. And we had them because I have this show you may or may not know by Highway to Health that we launched. But Dee was one of our guests recently. And he's so funny because it's just like, God, he's surrounded by vegans. Yeah. <laughs> his wife, all his kids. They, That's a reality yeah. show right yeah, there. That's yeah, what that time, is. Yeah, big time. But he's great. He gets it. And he's so healthy. And Dee is a great example of like people presuming. Like for those who know Twisted Sister, when you look at them. And I, re I remember when I joined my mum was worried because she had seen pictures and she said something to my dad like oh my god she's hanging out with twisted sister because they look you know they were like that glam metal thing yep yep but they're so it's so the opposite like d has never drank smoked never touched a drug in his life himself and his wife have been together for 50 years they're amazing he's so smart and so healthy and it's the opposite to what people think but he's a rock star right it's a gimmick yeah but yeah and it's funny and david's um david coverdale is very like mostly plant-based and still in touch about that all the time and you know i was just talking to his wife yesterday i'm gonna go up and cook them some food and oh for yeah, real show them some like home recipes because because they, they love it and they're just, you know, they're into health and they want to, people want to feel good as they age and especially into like retirement age for musicians who've been on the road for such a long time. Like oh, they yeah. want to feel good. Oh, so. yeah. And Bruce by default is very plant-based. He does eat a little bit of meat and some dairy, but he gets it. He's a really, really intelligent guy. He's a complete polymath. He's a fascinating, brilliant character and he gets it. So he's like, his rider and my rider are actually identical, except for he has hard boiled eggs. And so it's so funny. So a lot of people are aware health wise. So yeah, I think it's, and then we're good, at, good influences on each other. And it's, it's, it's good room for, for debate. It's interesting. Awesome. Makes great, interesting conversation. Oh, I have no doubt. Uh, where is Highway to Health in case the roomies want so to Highway, find it? Highway to Health is a brand new on YouTube. We just, um, we just decided to put it out as a like softly launch it on YouTube because it was, this is, crazy passion project myself and Derek Green from Sepultura for any metal listeners out there the singer of Sepultura is also like a long long time vegan we were trying to figure out if we collaborated how we could use our platform so we've all these great contacts and we play with all these bands so we started filming before the pandemic and the pandemic like everything else kind of shut everyone down but we had all this footage from around the world we've celebrity guests all over it everybody's on it yeah and we're just trying to figure out what do we do with these 23 terabytes of footage and we may end up still trying to go mainstream, but because of all, like everyone got delayed with what happened with the world, we were like, let's not let it all age. So we're going to just start dumping some of it on YouTube. So it's just literally, if you go on, it's called Derek and Tanya's Highway to Health on YouTube. And we have a couple of episodes up. We have like Kevin Smith and Kat Von D and we have one in, in Ireland, my hometown and Derek's hometown. And we're just going around talking to people from all different walks of life showing how easy it is to actually be plant-based does your family make any of the cuts are they oh all yeah my granny calls me cult leader in the <laughs> episode it's brilliant she's like veg she vegan she thinks my granny's 95 she's a legend and she i'm always giving her shit because she's like basically vegan she eats spuds and cabbage you know she's like a tiny bit of me but she's such a character and uh oh yeah we went into her and she's like well it's like a cult but she said yeah. She said it was brilliant. She said, but there's no harm in it. <laughs> <laughs> it like She's best, a legend. Best backhanded compliment I've ever got off my grandmother. You're in a cult. It's called vegan, but you know. <laughs> That's amazing. But you have to be able to laugh at this stuff. It's brilliant. Character. Brilliant. Granny. Yeah, yeah. So 95. the parents are in there and everything. And then, yeah. So we have so much. I mean, 
I have so many projects going that I'm just trying to make sure like everything is still tipping along as I do everything else. I also want to ask you about your neighbor, Bob. <clears throat> Bob is getting quite famous on your Instagram there, Tanya. Bob, yeah, he's going to kill me for talking about this already. He's like, <laughs> he's like really? He can't. Bob is brilliant. So I'm going to do a documentary based around the story of my neighbor, Bob, who's a, um ex-Vietnam vet, brilliant man, 75, really funny. Like I moved into this tiny desert town and we're... You couldn't like have two more diametrically different people. Um, in general, in that town, I stood out. Let's just say that. Can't imagine. Yeah, um, but we became fast friends, um, even though we're so opposite. And they're the greatest neighbors you could ever want. And they were telling me to turn up. I'm like, this has never happened. When a musician moves into a neighborhood, I'm, they're like, turn up. Because when I'm getting ready for tour, I'm really yeah. like playing loud. Sure. They're like, we love it. And Bob had a lot of loss last year. He lost his wife and his son in one day. And it kind of triggered mm. this um, this idea where I just I was trying to help when I was off the road because he's frustrated with the lack of services there for him through not not that it's the VA's fault but just in general the lack of services for mental health mm. for you know any other ways to cope with what had happened no idea about nutrition you know he's never cooked he's like a biker dude who's been on the road and you know yeah you know, just great like tough as old boots character so I was feeding him anyway so by osmosis he was kind of. <laughs> vegan by accident. right on feeling good liking it he calls it witchcraft he thinks i make grass it's, <laughs> it's all very funny like myself and bob's conversations are amazing he's he's brilliant but uh but anyway i was basically trying to figure out if i could um get a group of his friends that were in similar situations who had either had loss or trauma or just you know ptsd from back in the day and use food as just something exciting to i was going to just literally put on like a some workshop at town yeah yeah and um and then i thought wow well, maybe we should document it and then one of the foundations that i work alongside really liked the idea and we said well why don't we actually do a full story on this and also but more importantly like documentaries are great and media is really impactful but we should do a full study and come off the back of this with a published medical journal that we can hopefully implement into large groups so it's i'm right in r&d at the beginning of this so like no pressure talking about it live now i have to <laughs> should we even well i mean sh should we even include this in the final product do we need to take it you out you can no i'm let's yeah you tell me but oh, uh yeah, you tell me it's your project it put fire under yeah. <laughs> like but one of my reasons for being here this week other than like i'm a dork who wants to just infiltrate Nerd out, girl. I'm like i get to learn for free with all the doctors <laughs> <laughs> It's great, but I was also here scouting out who would be the best people to have involved because it's it's also going to be a very lighthearted and humor based. I'm all about that, like all yeah. the, all the shenanigans. We yeah. need lighthearted approaches, yeah. but some of the doctors that will be involved are here, so there's a lot of just networking around that because it's gonna it's gonna be a huge project. Outstanding, and it's um it's gonna take you know the really the right team, and obviously this is a great resource to to network with people with PCRM because, for sure. You know everybody's covering just about every topic, so I have Alan Desmond on board already. Al, that's yeah. my boy right yeah, there, Irish homie. Yeah. Yeah, You're man. not being biased, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> Irish doctors are awesome. So Alan's definitely on board and he's amazing. I'm meeting him in a couple of weeks actually to, to start the process there. And I um, might say Garth will probably be involved in Gemma, given the fact that we're now karaoke buddies. Oh yeah. <laughs> we don't have to tell that story today. But like experts from every, and, and very heavily focused on also on mental health and gut health correlation to mental health, which mm. I think that most people don't think about in general, but it's so powerful. And it's not to say that like, oh, you, you get a gastroenterologist and then their mental health issues are going to go away. But if they can feel better and they can start to make that connection, I'll also have like neurologists and we'll have like mindfulness practices mm. going on. So yeah, it's the, it's the beginnings of a very exciting project. I'm like, what am I after letting myself in for? <laughs> no, I'm pumped up, man. Cause like yeah, that's, excited. that's a total picture. Um, last question. That's still a fun one. You've gone all over the freaking world playing your music. You travel, like you have spent an inordinate amount of time on the road. What are the easiest countries to eat a healthy plant-based diet? Hmm. Not America. <laughs> really? <laughs> if you're on the, and amazed. Well, well, let me be more specific because I always laugh about this. If you're on the east and the west coast, easy. No problem. And most, it's getting better. But a couple of years back, if you're doing a bus tour in the middle of America or the Midwest or the south, it was hard because it's just more fast food. But um, mainland Europe is pretty easy. I mean, Germany is miles ahead with it. Um, I think that actually... Like the UK is also pretty good. It just because I'm looking at it from a different perspective, I don't think it's hard because mm. I've been doing it my whole life. So I know how to read a menu anywhere. So and food begins with psychology, obviously. So it's 
I have, like, I could say ever, I could sit here and list all the continents, basically. <laughs> but I, I mean, it's more about how to, like, how you read a menu. So you yeah. could be in France, or you could be in Cape Town, or you could be in Brazil. And ironically, like, Brazil, even though it's such, I go to Brazil a lot, and even though they eat a lot of meat, typically, they have the biggest abundance of fruits and vegetables in the world. So that's really easy in Brazil. Yeah. But people in Brazil don't often see what's right in front of them because they're, for some reason over the years, obviously meat has got associate, associated with affluence everywhere. So I think the hardest place is China just because it's such a meat culture in the markets. But at the same time, as you go out into rural cities, it's people are by default plant-based. Yeah. So everywhere is a little bit different. Um, but I've, you know, I've, I spent, the, my favorite thing about touring is food and finding restaurants. So oh, yeah. I, I, this question could take like two hours to answer if you want to like list. I mean, I honestly <laughs> think like that, I, I would hope that that's part of like highway to health, like some of your favorite oh, spots, yeah, yeah, the yeah. hot spots, yeah, yeah. like put them out there, mm-hmm. man. You know? Yeah, we've been out and we literally, we did like, we were, we've done quite a few countries already. And then we went on board with, uh, with Sea Shepherd doing like an ocean conservation episode, Fine. eating fully plant-based on the ships. We did stuff on the automotive industry. So we were with Ford in Brazil talking about like, what's you know what's really the story with electric and the interior of the car so we're covering quite a few different topics and we we shot one with brazil on in brazil with bruce on aviation on future aviation because that's something that i try to be very transparent about i hate that i have to fly this much but it's the nature of the beast of what sure, i do sure the flight's going anyway right yeah. so while i fly and go to places i try to use my platform and i don't turn away from things like aviation um, cause people are always like, oh, you fly so much. I'm like, I know, but some of the pilots that are involved in our, in our tours are very cautious and really, really want to make a difference for future aviations. And it is actually going faster than people know. And people like Bruce Dickinson's brilliant at this. Like they're all about trying to get carbon neutral flights. It's amazing, but it takes time and it takes going around the world. I know it's kind of a little ironic in a way, but a lot of the events I've been speaking at in Brazil and going back in October is how do we get everybody together and talk about the solutions without fighting, right? So mm-hmm. that can be everything from aviation to food. But at the end of the day, if ever there was a the closest thing to a panacea, it's getting the world to go plant-based. You know, the funny thing, Tanya, I'm, I'm sitting here, I've been listening to you talk this entire time, and I got to tell you, you are as brilliant as any doctor who I've talked to throughout the course of not just this conference, but the history of the show. And this this community that we are in needs more people like you. Absolutely Thank needs you more people that. because you can put the total package together. You know, a lot of people are an expert here, an expert there. You are one of the few who grasp the whole picture. All right. We all know that there are many pieces to it, but you actually get that understanding and you're making steps to connect all of the dots for so many people. Thank it takes you. a rare talent. That's a really big compliment. I appreciate that. But it's, you know, it's your life and uh, I guess networking and, and put it, I really like putting the right people together and having a platform. I mean, what's the point in having a platform if you don't use it for good, right? So, right and then being, I mean, I've been surrounded by brilliant people all week here, like completely in over my head going, you're amazing, but just absorbing all that energy. And I think a, a thing we need to do across the movement is to unite more on topics and stop fighting about the little details yeah. because it's not, you know, it's progress, not perfection. Like we can do a lot if we actually stop fighting about, you know, the yeah. opinion on this, that I won't get into details, but you know what I, I mean? got you. I got you, man. This but has yeah. been a treat. You want to come back sometime? Absolutely. All right. Count me it. in. All right. Appreciate Maybe I'll be a doctor by the next time I come back. Dr. Tanya, <laughs> Dr. rock star <laughs> MD. <laughs> If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.